we see undue influence coming up most often in financial exploitation cases. And it's a situation where a perpetrator basically gains control over the victim um, through doing things like isolating them from their family and their friends and their community, depriving them of the things that are meaningful to them in their lives, um, threatening them sometimes, um, undermining their confidence, really working to create an extreme dependence of the victim on the perpetrator. So then they start asking the victim for money and asking them for um, assets of the victim. And the victim very often says yes, because they are under the undue influence of the perpetrator. So as prosecutors, we look at those cases and we say, um, you know, can we show that this victim didn't truly consent to give the perpetrator their money? Do, can we show that the victim acted out of undue influence versus out of true consent? And if we have enough evidence to show that the victim really didn't truly consent to that transaction, we can prosecute it. This type of undue influence can more easily occur in people who have cognitive changes and weakened capacity, but it can happen to people with clear capacity if there is sufficient strategic efforts to change their beliefs and to provide them with fallacious information. And are there times in people's lives or certain types of people who might be more susceptible, who have capacity but might be more susceptible to undue influence? There are a number of issues that can occur in somebody with full cognitive capacity wherein they are vulnerable and weakened. Those would be times of grieving, emotional loss, loss of a relationship, uh, serious medical illness, um, any number of things that weaken my sense of personal um, strength and identity could be preyed upon by somebody else who thereby tries to meet my needs but for their purpose. And do you have advice for prosecutors if they might suspect undue influence in a case? How do they tease out whether undue influence is occurring and are there experts that they could work with that can help them in that? It is something that the prosecutors must always be aware of as do physicians who are evaluating. Um, many times something doesn't fit together in the story. Um, dramatic shifts of values, beliefs, on the part of an apparently capable person would suggest something is going on we, um, that is suspicious. We also will look to understand what, um, what parties gain on decisions that are made by a person who has an apparent capacity. And if preferentially the very person gains financially, socially, sexually, um, at the hands of their, quotes, victim, that should raise suspicion that there's a, an alternative motive. And one often has to look behind the scenes at what's happening. A prosecutor should look carefully and be aware if there's a pivotal point in time, is this uh, client uh, undergoing life changes? Is there a history of depression? So getting access to medical records, other collateral information, other family members uh, are important items. I have seen cases in which there's a family member exploiting an older adult and no one talked to the other siblings in the family who would have had very valuable information. So I think it's important not to just rely on one family member or one party in a family when there are multiple uh, parties in that family. They each may have a different perspective about what was happening. I often find prosecutors somewhat subdued in their enthusiasm to pursue prosecution of undue influence because the statutes around the country do not clearly uh, embody this as a crime. Instead, uh, prosecutors therefore back away because they fear it's too hard to pursue. What we recommend is really to conceptualize it as larceny or theft by deceit, um, by criminal uh, maliciousness, and find statutes that do fit uh, and pursue that. Now, I think an expert witness coming in on a case like this can talk about the nature and patterns of undue influence that can be very supportive to the case. Um, so I, I would encourage prosecutors to look beyond just the term prosecuting undue influence and try to look to what actually was gained in that undue influence and look at prosecuting that action. Some states um, have criminal statutes that actually mention undue influence. I, I, 
as a former prosecutor, I feel like those states are, are the lucky ones. Um, but New York State, where we're sitting right now, does not. And so I've had trials where the judge has warned me, uh, don't use the words undue influence because it's going to be too prejudicial to the jury. Um, but then we've checked with the judge, and it's okay to talk about um, the facts that actually comprise the undue influence, and we could use that to prove the theory of our case, which might be a theft by uh, deception, like larceny by false pretenses, or to show the relationship between the uh, abuser, I should say alleged exploiter, and the victim, and, and that's what we do. It's interesting because if you have a victim that's completely impaired, it's tough to argue undue influence, right? Mm -hmm. So if that victim was completely impaired at the time of the transfer, you're you may be cutting against yourself a little bit to say that person was in a relationship where they were manipulated and there was power and control. I have found that I've used it usually where the victim does have capacity um, or, or has maybe some challenges to cognition. Um, and I've used it in that situation a lot where because of the fact that they have challenges to cognition, they were easily manipulated by um, the alleged exploiter um, because of their relationship. I have to be creative. Without referring to undue influence, I have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that consent was taken away through manipulation. And what sorts of information or what sorts of things might you display or tell a jury in order to get that point across? What I try to do is show a profile of my victim prior to meeting the suspect and then how the victim's behavior often changed after meeting the suspect. Most times, suspect is gonna say as their defense, she gave it to me, he gave it to me, or it was a loan. I also try to focus upon what was it about the suspect that led the victim to believe in the suspect? What kind of statements did the suspect make that engendered some kind of connection with the victim. And I often find that the suspect has just out and out lied to them. Is a capacity evaluator able to explain undue influence and assess whether undue influence has happened in a specific case? An evaluator uh, it, it can lend, I think, very important information. Um, there are cases in which when I have an individual alone, they signal to me undue influence. Um, they may do that very subtly. They may, by emotional distress, when I bring up certain topics that warrant me to explore further. Um, when I'm uh, doing an evaluation, uh, I want to know, again, who brought the patient to my office? Is this the person who's going to derive some benefit? Um, is this the person who arranged for them to see an attorney of their choosing? Um, so there's collateral information, but really the emotional tone of the person. Uh, is important, and I do, again, underline how strongly important it is to have the evaluation occur absent anybody who may be influencing them. And only then do we get um, more candid appraisals. I recently had someone who, there's not much question in protective service mind, my mind actually, that they're being uh, exploited, and yet in the presence of that patient, their exploiter said to them, you know he's going to trick you to give him his answer. And it was very clear that there was undue influence. She then was escorted out by the police. And at the end, he said, no, she's fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And I said, would you like someone else to manage your money? And he said, yes. Yeah. So one has to look at very subtle things in a psychiatric assessment. Yeah. I have a case where an elderly man was a recent widower. And he had lost his wife of many years. And his wife had been the person who took care of the family's assets and basically ran the home. Uh, he had a mild developmental disability. And he'd also had a number of physical ailments in his life that made him quite vulnerable. So when his wife died, he was bereft. And he was very much alone in life. And a woman who was about 20 years younger than him met him, knew he had significant financial assets, and convinced him very quickly to move in with her. She then took over his finances. She promised him she'd handle everything for him and it would all be taken care of. And he consented because he trusted her and because he depended on her and he believed that she would take care of him. 
So um, in the end, he ended up losing literally all the assets he had to her, and we ended up prosecuting her for theft. And even though we don't have an undue influence statute, we were able to, we were able to successfully prosecute her because our theory was that his consent was not true consent. It was consent based on the manipulation, the lies, the isolation, and all these other tactics that she had perpetrated on him. And we were successful in our, in our prosecution of that case.